The Thing is a cinematic paradox in that it was widely criticised on release and was in fact referred to by some as the worst film ever made, whilst today it's seen as a classic of the genre, lauded by some of those same critics. An oxymoron that can be partly attributed to the fact everybody back then hated thinking about how the film ended. Okay, so the, for the people who haven't seen the film, mm -hmm. how does it end? Well, for those of you who haven't seen the film, or perhaps don't remember how it ends, the ending of the thing shows the last remnants of an Arctic research base. Arctic re research base slowly freezing to death in... Damn it! You know what? I'm just going to read out what I wrote. It's clearly my mind's not working today. So, as a reminder, the thing ends with the last remnants of an Arctic research team slowly freezing to death in a bombed-out base they leveled in an attempt to destroy a lethal parasitic alien life form from beyond the stars. Sometimes, your brain just doesn't work very well. I'm sorry, folks at home. It happens a lot. I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's most days these days, but I still try. And you know what? I wrote the article, so fuck it, I'm not plagiarising anything. It's my words anyway. You're allowed to read it, it's fine. Yeah, and one of the things I'd like to point out is that the of these two survivors, one is played by known hero of this earth, Keith David. Oh yeah, Keith David, yeah. I fucking love Keith David. Like, hey, it's me, Reverse Giraffe. You know me, I'm Reverse Giraffe. I have a short neck and legs. I think secretly he was the thing at the end. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, you can think that, and there are a lot of fan theories about what the actual ending of the film is there to suggest. And there are a couple that I'd like to debunk right now, because there's one that, oh, well, Keith David must be the thing, because you see that he's not breathing. You can't see his breath. And you can see his breath in the Blu-ray version. But oh. the version a lot of people saw like, either on TV or DVD or VHS, which is like how I first saw it, because that's how fucking old I am. Just the quality is not good enough to see his breath. But in the Blu-ray version, you can clearly see that Keith David does have his breath. You can see that it's making um, steam in the air. Uh, well, it's not okay. steam, but it's, it's, you, know, you can see it reacting yeah. with the cold air. Fire's got the temperature up all over the camp. Won't last long, though. Neither will we. And one of the things that I hate about The Thing is that the prequel completely ruins the ambiguity, which I have to mention because in the prequel it is established that when The Thing takes somebody over and becomes them, it cannot take on any artificial parts of their body. And one of the ways they realise in that film that someone's been taken over is that they spit out their fillings. Because when The Thing replicates you, it replicates you perfectly and removes all the things that you've added to your body after the fact, like fillings or piercings. Good. And Lars has feelings. So he's human. It can't imitate inorganic material. See? And Keith Davies' character has an earring, which means he can't be the thing as established by the law of the prequel. Oh, because I've not seen the, the prequel, so I, I have. know that. And I hate that because it removes the ambiguity. Because the point is, you're not supposed to know, yeah. just like the characters in that scene do not know whether or not they are a thing or the person they're sat opposite is one. And it, it does kind of ruin it when you've got clues. Yes. You mean, yeah, you're not supposed to know anything, but when, you, when people are missing certain parts that you would notice, you think, oh wait, that's yeah. an obvious clue there. And it's just like, oh, well, let's spoil it. Yeah, well, the prequel completely ruins it. It removes the ambiguity. Because there are a couple of things that like, fans like to point to. They say like, oh, well, McCreary, when he hands Childs um, that drink of whiskey, that's actually the petrol from the petrol bombs he was doing. And, like John Carpenter, when he hears these theories, just says, it doesn't matter. He says, it doesn't matter. If you think that's what he does, that's fine, but that's not what's in the script. And for those wondering, the script does not clarify one way or other whether or not someone in that scene is a thing. Although, um, there was a proposed sequel where Kurt Russell survived, so he's definitively not a thing. Um, and they were going to explain um, Kurt Russell being like 30 years older by saying he got so much frostbite on his face that he just got all fucked up and that's why he looks older. And nowadays they could probably just like, you know, use some of that Marvel CGI tech to make him look young. Um, as weird as it can look when they try and make a, an actor look younger. I oh, think man. it was um, Robert Downey Jr. in like the flashback scenes. It, it's just, a little oh, bit off, isn't it? You can just tell something's not right. ...is a metric for potential. If that's true, you'll be a great man someday. I'll get the bags. He does miss you when you're not here. Like bringing it back to the thing, the ending of the film was absolutely supposed to be 100% ambiguous. And John Carpenter, the director, has gone on record saying, you are not supposed to know whether or not either of the characters is a thing. Like the ending is supposed to be ambiguous, it's supposed to be nihilistic. And that's one of the reasons people hated the thing when it first came out. And the thing got savaged by critics. 
um, and one of which, as mentioned, referred to as the worst film ever made. And John Carpenter has a really adorable theory about why The Thing failed. And, and what's that? Well, I'll give you a clue, Nisha. The Thing released the same weekend as E.T. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the alien film. And, yeah. and John Cameron said, "Yeah, after what after ET came out, and it's you know it's a film that gives an altogether more positive image of what might happen if we were visited by extraterrestrials. I don't think there was any want from an audience for a film where a violent, virulent, parasitic alien from beyond the stars beats people to death with its big meaty appendages." That that thing is disgusting though like it's horrifying when you yes. first see the dog that i was just like oh no not the dog and the dog changes i'm like oh it's so gross uh, that dog is one of the best animal actors i've ever seen mm. like where the dog walks in with the other dogs and he just sits down yeah it's so good that it's so unsettling when the, and all the other dogs lose their shit and it's just just sits down And I adore that scene because you get so few glimpses into the inner workings of the thing's mind. Because almost every scene where in which the thing appears is with somebody. So it has to pretend to be someone. But in that scene, you see, it just shuts down. It's freaking. It's like when animals stare into the corner of a room and bark. And I'm like... That's, That's it. You don't know what they're seeing. That's like the only time I kind of believe paranormal videos is when cats and dogs start acting weird because they don't just put on a show. Yeah. They are reacting to something they physically sense. And their senses are so much more acute than ours. Mm -hmm. like the one that got me is when animals were seemingly able to tell where Pokemon were in Pokemon Go. Do you ever what? see any videos like what? that? <laughs> no. I don't want you to get your Pokemon Go thing and be yeah. like a, a Pidgey on the floor. Dogs seemingly knew where the Pidgey was because they like bark at the area where the Pidgey was on the screen. And there's loads of it and I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? That's creepy. <laughs> so people didn't like the thing. They did not know. It was very, very poorly received by both critics and audiences. And um, audiences especially did not go to see the thing in the numbers the studio expected. It was a horrible loss for the studio and it actually cost John Carpenter a director's role because uh, the studio had him for like a three picture deal and the thing was so poorly received they just bought him out of his contract. Fittingly we'll go to now the ending of the thing which was similarly criticised and hated by critics and audiences and nothing epitomises this more than an experience John Carpenter had that gave him a very very poor feeling about how the thing was going to do. He went to a test screening and everybody hated it. Everybody hated the effects. They thought all the, you know, the creature effects were disgusting. People were standing up and leaving midway through the film. And they found it like, you know, just awful, dour, nihilistic. And right at the end, a lady came up to him and asked him, um, so what happened at the end? Who was the thing? And John said, oh, it's, it's up to you. Use your imagination. She went, oh, I hate that. <laughs> I hate using my imagination I hate when I have to think about the media I consume. I don't think anything sums up just the general audience for film than that. Of I hate having to think about the media I consume more than not at all. I just want to be spoon fed it. Tell me how it ends. Tell me. So wouldn't you prefer to think about it? One of my favourite things about watching a film is that moment when you're leaving the cinema and you walk home and you talk about the film and what you thought about it. Yeah, exactly. Like. You know, was Keith David the thing? Was Kurt Russell the thing with neither of them? Did they freeze to death? It's like, oh. You know, then you start throwing around like theories and stuff like that, and then you know, on later rewatches, you look for details and things. And if you're like me, you watch the prequel and go, damn it! <laughs> damn you, prequel! Ruined, ruined the ending. <laughs> the ending of the prequel is terrible as well, because um, I don't mind spoiling that fucking film because it's shit. Um, the, the last two people there, one of them is a thing, and the other person has them at flamethrower point. Mm -hmm. And it pisses me off because they immediately burn the person to death when, because they know they're a thing instead of conversing with them. Because that is the only time in the Thing and the Thing prequel where anybody has a chance to actually talk to the Thing when it knows it's been caught. All the rest of the times, it immediately attacks because it thinks it can survive. But in that situation, they have it like at gunpoint, figuratively, because it's a flamethrower, mm -hmm. which I think is much more scary. And the Thing knows it's done and they don't talk to it. It's like, this is your one chance. You can find out what it's thinking. You can figure out what it's doing. Yeah. You can talk to it. It's like, no, I'll burn it to death. Damn it! The one thing they could have done to make that film interesting, they didn't. Kate! Kate! No! But also, 
also like mentioning how people were walking out of the cinema because yeah. it was too gross. I think that's like a compliment for like a horror film. It is, yes. But, uh, you want to be like, ugh. The effects guy, uh, Rob Bettine, was uh, very happy about that. Mm. Uh, he took great pleasure in his effects, like making people squeamish. Like he's the guy who did the Robocop suit and the Melting Man. The Melting Man effect. And he took great pride in the Melting Man effect, making people cheer. Because yeah. uh, a story about Robocop, which we've covered before, is that. Uh, the Melting Man scene almost got that film an X rating. And they were told like, it's going to get an X rating, which for an American film is basically a death sentence. You are not going to get it in any cinema. I think it's the MPAA who does their rating said, you have to cut this scene. It's too disgusting. And um, Paul Verhoeven, the director, said, people love the scene. People love this scene. It's so good. Why would we cut it out? And he had to collect a bunch of comment cards from people who'd seen early test screenings where they said, Oh, your favourite part where the man who melts gets exploded <laughs> by that car and he took it to the MPAA and said, like, well, seemingly no one gives a shit. So we thought people would be too squeezed, but they, apparently they love it. Fuck it, you can keep it in. And they kept the R rating with that scene. It's funny to think about stuff like that because, yeah, it's not... I don't think it's that bad because especially now when you've got the Saw films. Yes. That's well, like nothing. <laughs> the hostile films, things of that nature. Like They're all really awful. 